Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. Just waiting for people to join. Uh, so we'll wait about 30 to 60 seconds. Well, welcome everyone to the next um, install in our Patient Symposium virtual series. Uh, we're excited to have you all join us this afternoon. We've got um, a busy agenda. And so I just would like to start uh, with a few announcements. Uh, first, to recognize our sponsors who've generously supported this program for the entire month. And um, a few other announcements of things that are in your um, app, um, information that we want to make sure you're, you're aware of. First is that um, we have a new diagnosis code um, for Friedrich's ataxia. This code is incredibly important when you're going to the doctor's uh, office. When they fill out um, the encounter or billing form for your visit, they include a reason why you're there, a diagnosis code. And previously, the diagnosis code that was available was, that um, physicians had to use was for multiple types of inherited ataxias. And um, thanks to Susan Walther um, on the FARA team, she worked really hard over the last year um, to make sure that there was a new diagnosis code added for Friedrich's ataxia. And so it's gonna be important when you go to the doctor's office to make sure that they know that there is this new code, G11.11. .11. And there's information for you in uh, the meeting materials that you can print and take to your next appointment. We also would like for you to save the date for the virtual FARA Energy Ball, Saturday, November 7th. Um, it is virtual. Everyone can participate this year from the comfort of your own home. Uh, we'll live stream a program to you that evening, so it'd be fun to invite um, maybe a few friends over or gather your family for a special meal and tune into the Energy Ball. And for those, um, who are participating in the Ride a Taxi a Global Challenge. Thank you so much. Um, we're about halfway through. Uh, Kyle will be posting the updated mileage tomorrow, but we have people cycling, running, walking, exercising, uh, raising money all around the world, and we've been visiting lots of research labs as we go. Um, if you haven't tuned into the Global Challenge, I encourage you to. Uh, you can go to rideataxia.org and there's all the information there to connect to the progress we're making as a team, uh, to join the Global Challenge, and to also um, see all the great research labs and places we've toured um, as we make our way around the globe. Another um, announcement is that we're asking you to submit your questions on gene therapy in advance of our session in two weeks. So on October 22nd, we'll have two sessions related to gene therapy. And we'd really like for you to submit your questions in advance so that we can cover as many topics um, that are of interest to the patient community as possible. So if you go to the event wall on the app or on your website, uh, you can click this comment button right here and submit your questions. And Susan will be uh, picking those up and working with our panelists to make sure that we get to all your questions on the 22nd. So we'll get started now for today. Um, we're going to have three separate talks. And at the end of each talk, we're going to allow time for Q&A. There is a Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that, you can type in questions. If you see a question that's of interest to you, um, you can upvote that question. And um, we'll try and take as many questions as we can if we don't have enough time for all the questions. Um, the, in the speaker information in the app, um, you can see um, how to connect with speakers directly and follow up with them on your own. 
um, either through the app or through email to ask them your questions. These um, webinars will be recorded and will be available about two hours after the session ends. And if you're having trouble with the app, um, please contact Jamie Dean, her email's right here. All right, so with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker for this evening. Um, Liz Serrani is the Associate Director of Research at FARA. Hey, Liz. Hello. <laughs> thanks, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, Liz is celebrating her one year anniversary with FARA. Um, and while she's um, only with FARA for a year, she's been in our FA research community for more than 10 years. Um, many of you might know that Liz was a staff scientist at Scripps Research Institute in Dr. Gottesfeld's lab, where she studied the mechanisms of the FA gene silencing. Uh, she worked on drug discovery with the HDAC inhibitors, developed cell models um, that are used in labs all over the world um, right now. And in her role um, as a director of research at FARA, you know, she helps um, inform our research priorities, manage our grant program, and she directs several research projects for us as well. And so I'm happy to have Liz here this afternoon, who's going to um, kind of take you through an overview of different approaches to treatment based on our understanding of the disease. So Liz, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jen, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Um, as Jen mentioned with this talk today, um, and I'm going to share my screen first. Uh, there it is. Okay, I hope you can all see it. Um, as Jen mentioned with this talk today, I'd like to um, give you kind of an overview of the disease and actually take you inside the cells in your body and try to explain um, first what the genetic mutation is, uh, then what is cons its consequences um, are inside the cell, um, what efforts FARA is undertaking to further this knowledge by funding research, and finally, how this knowledge uh, has informed us on a potential therapeutics and, and therapies. So just to give you some perspective on how far along we've come to understand the disease, um, here is a timeline. So in 1863, uh, Nikolaus Friedreich, a German pathology, pathologist, uh, described a new spinal disease um, characterized by ataxia, which means impaired coordination, that affected uh, children of uh, unaffected parents. Um, and uh, in, 19, in 1876, um, he proposed that the disease had a genetic base. Um, and uh, it took 100 years from that, uh, that uh, first uh, discovery uh, for the genetic locus to be identified in 1996 by Dr. Pandolfo and his team. And they found that uh, a repeated sequence at this location, a GAA triplet, was polymorphic, which means that its length changed among different people. So almost 25 years later, um, we now have so many promising potential therapeutic in our pipeline. And um, you will hear that um, in a few minutes from Jen Farmer. So let me take a step back first and remind you of a few things that you probably studied in school. Um, so what is a genetic locus? Um, well, you might know that uh, the genetic information inside your cells determines uh, a lot of who you are. Um, for example, how tall you are or what your eye color is. Um, and um, this information is written in an important molecule called DNA. So the DNA is made by four simple building blocks. Uh, they are abbreviated by four letters, A, C, G, and T. Uh, and it is the sequence of these four building blocks that makes up your genes. 
So it's a very simple code, just four letters, but the combination are infinite. And when we talk about GAA repeats in FA, we refer to these GAA building blocks. Now, in FA, there's a gene that's called FXN or frataxin, in which these GAA triplets are repeated many times. They are repeated up to 30 times in unaffected individuals, but more than 100 in FA patients, and actually most patients have between 600 and 900 repeats. Um, so, Dr. Pandolfo uh, found that when the GAA repeat number is low, less than 30, as I said, um, the frataxin gene is active in all cells and does what it's supposed to do, make the frataxin protein. But uh, when the repeat number is high, uh, the gene does not work anymore or not as much um, and makes very little of the frataxin protein. And since this discovery, um, scientists uh, have been trying to understand why these long GAA repeats are causing the gene to be uh, almost inactive. So let's go back to our genes. Um, how do the genes determine uh, how tall you are or what color eyes you have? Uh, well, they do so making proteins. Um, Proteins are, for example, structural components of your bodies. Um, you all know that you need proteins, for example, to make your muscles. Um, but there are also enzymes that are important to speed up uh, the, uh, all the uh, chemical reactions inside your cells. So how do we go from a gene to a protein? Um, to make proteins, our genes need to first be copied into a molecule that's called mRNA, where the M stands for messenger RNA. And this process is called transcription. And the molecule messenger RNA, the mRNA, carries the DNA information from the nucleo, where the DNA lives, and the place to the place where proteins are produced. And to explain this mechanism, this whole process, um, I would like to use this analogy. Um, to the right there, I would like you to think of genes as roads and of transcription as a truck that has to drive along the road, our gene. It has to carry a template, a sort of a mold, the messenger RNA, that needs to be um, delivered to an assembly line to make a certain product that in, in our case is the protein for taxin. So what happens to uh, our FXN gene, our road, when uh, less than 30 repeats are present? This, you can see this little red speed bump. Um, well, Many trucks drive easily along the road, deliver the, their cargo, their mold to the assembly line. The assembly line makes the final product using the mold and our favorite protein, protein for taxin is made. Now, what happens to our road when we have hundreds of GAA repeats? Well, the speed bumps becomes this huge obstacle and the truck um, has a really hard time going over it. And um, something that we really don't quite understand happens, um, but this block sends a signal to the beginning of the road, and many of these uh, do not enter signs are posted at the beginning of the road, and the road is blocked, so very few trucks manage to get to the end of the road and deliver very few mold, so very little for taxin is made. There are a few groups that are funded by FERA to try to understand these mechanisms and try to understand how that block uh, works with the, this do not enter signs to, to silence the gene. Uh, 
So what are these blocks on the road? So one idea is that they are sort of a tangles of DNA and RNA that occur during the process of transcription. Um, and in this process, the long GNA, GAA repeats cause this part of the gene to go from a long, nice linear rope to kind of a, a sort of a knot. And this knot becomes an obstacle in the road. And what are the uh, do not enter signs? Well, this, these signs are literally codes that are written on the gene when the gene needs to be shut down. And they're written by enzymes that are, that are called code writers. So when they work, they compact the gene so tightly that um, it cannot function anymore and it becomes inactive. So when these codes are deposited on the gene, um, our, our for taxing road, no more trucks can go through. Um, this, me this mechanism, um, the, the work of these code writers, is actually a normal process in the cells where uh, genes need to be regulated all the time. Some need to be active, some need to be repressed, depending on the cell type and the cell status. But in the case of FA, the frataxin gene, which is an essential gene and should not be inactivated, becomes accidentally coded as closed because of the effect of the long GAA repeats. So now that we know a little more about the mechanism of rotaxin silencing, why the, genes is, the gene is not working properly, um, I'd like to share with you um, how we can use this knowledge to develop therapies. So we just learned about this do not enter signs, these codes. So one way to reactivate the gene is to erase the code and this can be done by engaging these code eraser enzymes or blocking the activity of the writer, the writers, so that without the code, the gene is not compacted anymore and the road is open again. So let's go back to the tangles, the tangles in the road, those knots, right? Um, another therapeutic approach is to try to untangle those knots that block the road. And um, one way to do this is to use oligonucleotides. And these are small pieces of DNA. Uh, they are made that, by those four building blocks that we talked about earlier, A, C, T, G. Um, and they can bind, here it is, the GAA tangle um, or the are nearby, the repeats, and interfere with the formation of those knots so that um, they can remove the obstacle and the trucks can go through. And FERA is funding this type of research at UT Southwestern and UMass. So, there's actually another way that we can use uh, these oligonucleotides. Um, I told you that the trucks need to deliver their mold to the assembly line in order to, for frataxin to be produced, but I didn't tell you what happens to the mold when the process is finished. Um, well, the mold is trashed, is destroyed. Um, so um, what these oligos uh, can also be used for is to help with recycling the mold. So even if we, um, we have a few molds that are delivered, they can be used multiple times and um, more frataxin can be produced from fewer molds. Um, so another way to um, allow our trucks to go through the road um, is, um, well, to use molecules to make our truck a supercharged truck that can go through the obstacles and the do not enter signs and deliver the mold at the end of the road.
And there are molecules that do just that. They make the truck more potent. And these molecules were developed by Dr. Asim Ansari, um, this is, who is now at St. Jude with fair support. Um, and they're called synthetic transcription factors or SYNTEFs. And also this technology has been further developed at the um, at Design Therapeutic with FERA support. So another way to approach the problem, um, because FA is a monogenic disease, meaning that only one gene is mutated, and because the frataxin road is blocked, um, so a, a therapeutic approach is to give the cell a brand new functioning and open road. And this is what gene therapy does. It delivers a functional version of the FXN gene or the frataxin gene to the cells by using harmless viruses. Why do we use viruses? Um, well, because they have they're very efficient at doing that. They have evolved to enter a cell, a human cell, and deliver genetic information. And um, you'll learn a lot about, about this. Jen mentioned it uh, on October 21st, 22nd. And um, you learn about its promises and its challenges um, later on. Um, but FIRA is funding uh, various laboratories to work on this. And especially, um, we are trying to, to find the right type of virus and also to look for alternatives to, to viral deliveries. So I told you that basically all the issues come from these GAA repeats, these expanded long GAA repeats. So um, an obvious therapeutic approach is to get rid of the repeats altogether. Um, and a few years ago, um, an important discovery was made by two investigators, one in the US and one in France, um, who just received the Nobel Prize this past week for this discovery. Uh, that um, allow for editing the genome. And this tool is called uh, CRISPR. And um, really what it is, is the equivalent of a pair of scissors um, and that you can target anywhere in the genome um, and that allow you to modify and edit the DNA sequence of genes. Um, Similar to gene therapy, this approach required that these protein, um, the scissors in the cartoon, are delivered uh, to the cell using viruses. Um, and currently, FERA is funding a few of these efforts, um, both uh, in academia and in industry. So a somewhat similar approach to gene therapy um, that are all, also has some components uh, that take advantage of the CRISPR technology um, is to use stem cells. So there's a lot of discussion and expectations on stem cell therapy um, for many diseases, but um, using stem cell therapy um, is, not, is very challenging and um, is not as simple as delivering stem cells in your body and hoping that they go to the right places and become the right type of cells. And because of all these challenges in the field, um, FERA's efforts are focused on um, a specific application of stem cells. So there's a very specific type of stem cells that can be isolated from the bone marrow and then genetically modified using, for example, CRISPR to cut out the repeats in a dish and then reintroduce in the body and hopefully be used to support the survival of cells like brain cells that are struggling because um, they have lost for taxin. So one possible way that these cells are beneficial is by transferring some of their um, their content, including frataxin, uh, to unhealthy FA cells. And FERA is funding investigator at Stan in the investigators at Stanford and the UC San Diego to study whether this approach works in FA and in particular using mouse models. 
So we talked a lot about the road, you know, the protection gene and how to reactivate it. But um, what does the uh, protein uh, that is produced by this gene does? What is protection? So protection is a small protein that, that lives in a special compartment of the cell called mitochondria. Um, you might have heard of them because they are essential for cell survival as, you know, they produce um, the energy that the cell needs. Um, inside the mitochondria, frataxin is itself a part of an assembly line without a proteins. Um, and this assembly line takes sulfur, this yellow ball here, and iron, this orange ball here, and makes these molecular clusters. They're called iron sulfur clusters. And these iron sulfur clusters are then assembled inside proteins called iron sulfur cluster proteins. So what do these proteins do? Um, well, they do a lot of different things. <laughs> and if you look at the cartoon to the right, um, so this is a, a cartoon of a cell and um, iron sulfur cluster proteins are involved in all the different pathways and reaction depicted there. So you can understand now why having the frataxin gene malfunctioning and um, as a consequence, having low level of the frataxin protein uh, is so detrimental to the cell. So let's look at some of the consequences of retaxing loss and, um, and how the reduction of this iron sulfur crustin protein affect the cell. Um, so this protein are um, involved in making energy. So the cells are, is going to struggle to make energy to survive. Um, also low frataxin means elevated iron because iron cannot be incorporated in the clusters anymore, causing damage and cell death. Um, also, when these chemical processes that, that, um, that make energy are disrupted, um, they form, um, when they're disrupted, they form uh, very damaging molecules. And these cause oxidative stress and damage to the cell, damage to the cell membrane, and damage to the DNA. So um, for reason that we do not quite understand, also the pathway that inside the cell is responsible for counteractive counteracting this oxidative damage is also defective. So you have a sort of a demo whammy. You have increased oxidative stress, but also a decreased defense against the oxidative stress. So how do we use this knowledge to develop therapies that, that fix the, the problem at the protein level? Um, like for gene therapy, uh, where we can deliver a functioning frataxin gene to the cell, um, similarly, we can deliver the frataxin protein to the cell. So this is called um, protein replacement therapy. And this has been around for a long time. Um, for example, insulin administration is a form of protein replacement therapy. But in this case, um, the frataxin protein here has to enter the cell and go to the mitochondria. And proteins are generally too big to cross the cell membrane. So what scientists thought of was um, to use a tool that once again is stolen from a virus, <laughs> from virus biology. And this is a small tag called TAT that is attached to frataxin and allows frataxin to enter the cell. So another approach, instead of trying to restore frataxin level, is finding a way to go around it. So um, I told you that um, frataxin is a component of this irosulfur cluster assembly line. And without frataxin, the assembly line does not produce enough iron sulfur clusters. But what if you could find ways to substitute for frataxin or modify the other component of the assembly 
uh, to make the assembly line work without frataxin. And these are what we call frataxin mimetics and would still allow uh, for iron sulfoclast formation in the absence of frataxin. And um, in the last few years, FERA has been uh, funding quite a few efforts on this um, at uh, two laboratories in France, one in Argentina, and one at the Broad Institute. So finally, uh, we saw earlier uh, that the consequences of protecting loss in the cell are many, um, but each of them actually represents an opportunity to develop uh, therapeutics. For example, tackling cell death due to iron overload or use um, antioxidants um, um, or, or also molecules that uh, can boost the antioxidant response or try, trying to counteract um, the uh, energy deficiency. So, as you can see here, FERA is funding many projects that are tackling these pathways. Um, but um, something that is also important to point out is that some of these pathways are common to other diseases. And so the hope here is that we can learn from other diseases and we can leverage the therapeutic development in other diseases because um, this can really speed up the drug development process. And I'm going to end with a summary of what we know about FA, um, how, um, how we go from the GA repeat expansion um, to low frataxin, um, uh, damage and malfunction in the cell and ultimately to symptoms and where all the therapeutic approaches that we talked about intervene here in this chart. And um, I believe Jen is going to pick up from here and update you on uh, where the, the, this different approach stands at the moment. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you, Liz. That was excellent um, overview. You covered a lot of information, uh, 20 years worth of research <laughs> in 30 minutes. Well done. Um, Thank you. So we already have um, some questions coming in. And so uh -huh. um, our first question is from Tamara and she is asking, should people with FA get less iron? Um, so no, <laughs> you, you need iron, <laughs> it's very important. And in fact, there were um, some, um, some therapies that were using some iron chelators um, that um, to try to um, you know, provide a benefit. And it turns out that uh, chelating iron and removing iron is not a good way. <laughs> Um, uh, to, to treat the disease. Um, so um, I'd say that you still need iron. Thank you, Liz. Um, another question from Randy. So um, we hear, we've heard in the past about excess iron and oxidative stress, but you know, with the example you provided, it looks like there might also be excess sulfur in the FA cells. And is there any concern with excess sulfur? There are no data that show actually excess sulfur. Um, there, um, I think um, people have looked at that and it doesn't seem to be a problem. Thank you. Um, so Dylan is asking us um, a gene therapy question. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so um, we'll, we'll, we'll try and quickly cover it as best we can, but we're going to get into these topics in more detail um, on the 22nd of October. But he's asking, um, you know, can you, when we think about therapies, can you potentially have um, both gene therapy and, um, wait, can we only get gene therapy and not do gene repair? Placement too. I'm wondering if he's, protein. Yeah, I think yeah. he's asking. No, I think you can you can do both. I mean, technically, if one is successful, you don't need the other. 
Uh, but um, because the protein um, is delivered, um, you don't need a virus. So it would be a problem if the protein had, needs to be the real life. For example, uh, if you have to combine uh, like the cutting of the GAA repeat with CRISPR and gene therapy, because you have to use viruses, most likely viruses for both. And sometimes when you do gene therapy and you use one virus, then you're not eligible for, um, you know, for, um, for a therapy that uses another virus because your immune system can react to that. But in theory, uh, you could do both. But, you know, it, you know if, the, if, for example, gene therapy works, you, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't need to do protein replacement therapy. I guess that also just gets to the whole concept of needing um, multiple therapies that are targeting different sure. underlying mechanisms of the disease because you know, at least right now with the viruses that are available for gene therapy, it might not be possible to target both, for example, the brain and the heart. Right. Um, and, you know, that's another reason why these combination approaches and combination therapies um, are, you know, all it, why we're trying to cast a wide net, and, you know, be really diverse in different treatment approaches. Um, oh, Ron Bartek, I guess we should take his question list. Um, oh, about he, it. I yeah, I, <laughs> I think he's, yeah, so he, he reframed the question to say, how about gene therapy plus protein supplementation with breast? With sure, yeah, breast. I think, yeah, I think Jenna has just answered that, yeah. Of course, if with gene therapy, you only target the brain, for example, then you can use the protein replacement therapy to target the heart. And the two, the two uh, therapies, having one doesn't not does not preclude you to, to get the other, from getting the other. Great, well, thank you so much, Liz. Um, appreciate your, I love your analogy of the road and the trucks. Um, and uh, hopefully folks um, you know, enjoyed it as well and, and learned a little bit more about the research that's been ongoing. And um, I'm going to transition now to my presentation. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. And um, let's see. Sorry about that. Um, so this afternoon, I would like to give you an update on you know various fair research programs, um, as well as updates on clinical trials that um, are in the treatment pipeline right now. Um, and as I get started on the FARA research updates, um, I'm really excited to share with you today and, and introduce um, our community to the newest member to, of the FARA team, uh, Dr. Barbara Tate. And Barbara joined the team on June 1st as our Chief Scientific Officer. And um, she comes to us um, having had a, a career as um, an academic scientist where she did a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, she then went on to manage the neurodegenerative disease group at Pfizer and got a lot of experience in drug development. And from there, Barbara went on to be a founder in several biotech companies, also working on therapies for neurodegenerative disease. And most recently, uh, she was with the Dementia Discovery Fund as a venture partner and chief of strategy. And I asked Barbara to uh, join us this afternoon just to say hello to all of you so that you can meet her um, virtually. Um, and uh, she was uh, logging her miles today as well for the Ride Ataxia Global Challenge. I believe she ran a marathon before our session today. So um, please welcome Barbara. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you for the kind introduction. Yeah, and that picture looks a lot better than I do right now, but forgive me, but it was a long run. I am more than thrilled to be part of the FAIR community. It is just such an incredible organization, as you just heard um, Liz, you know, the brilliance and the innovation and the 
creativity and imagination that Vera and Vera um, partners represent. You know, we, um, Jen and I have made a pact that we are, we are going to retire when we find the, the effective therapeutics for this disease. And we both intend to retire. <laughs> so we're very excited about, um, you know, the progress that's been made and where we are. And I'm um, looking forward to Jen's talk and to Dave's talk of really compelling um, treatment pipeline. So thanks again, Jen. Barbara, thanks for joining us. And I look forward to everyone in our community getting to meet you in person at, at events next year. So, you know, I know that um, this year has been challenging for us for many reasons. And so I, I made a little cartoon. I am not an artist. I am not good with things like paint and, um, you know, uh, drawing software, but I, I took a, my, my, my best attempt here um, to just kind of summarize some of what um, has happened um, and how this year has impacted FAIR as an organization. Um, so here on the first slide, you know, um, we are obviously always um, worried about fundraising. Um, and then certainly once um, COVID hit and we've had to cancel many events throughout the year or think about you know, doing all of our events virtually, you can see um, our worry around fundraising goes up. Um, and many of you have risen to that challenge and helped us by, um, you know, participating in all of these events virtually and, and helping us reach our fundraising goals uh, with the Ride Ataxia program and grassroots fundraising. And so thank you all very much for that. The other thing that was impacted this year by COVID is clinical research. And so at the beginning of the year, we had um, one trial that was open and enrolling. And near the end of the first quarter, we actually had um, multiple trials open and enrollment was starting to increase. And then when we got our stay at home orders that essentially flattened, you know, crashed down, flattened out for a while um, because we couldn't go to our clinical centers and our, our clinical research um, was essentially shut down for several months. But fortunately by about early June, um, our centers were slowly starting to reopen and be able to restart many of our clinical studies. And we have actually um, done really well at continuing enrollment in the trials that were ongoing, as well as starting new trials um, with several more even projected before the end of the year. On our grant program, um, in the, the graph here, I just, you know, suggested that we start off the year um, with a clean slate and we start funding research grants. Um, and fortunately, we've been able to continue funding research grants at the same pace that we wanted to, um, that we anticipated. And we've even added some new programs this year um, to award some new research grants. And so um, we have not slowed down and we've actually had a record year in terms of number of grant submissions, probably because our researchers were um, behind their computers a little bit more of the time rather than in the lab. And just in case um, folks weren't following or maybe other folks who are following were thinking the same thing, um, my last graph is of Kyle's facial hair. You will notice throughout his many ride ataxia challenges this year, um, he gets a mustache and a beard and then they come off and then it comes back and then it goes off. Um, so these are uh, some of the fair changes that we've observed during 2020. Um, so because of some of the challenges that we had, um, you know, we, it gave us an opportunity to really think about some new programs. We, um, Liz organized a um, flash talk seminar series in the month of May as part of FA Awareness Month uh, as a way to keep our young investigators engaged while they were away from the lab. It was incredibly successful. Uh, we had, I think it was around 16 young investigators participate uh, sharing their research with our community. We've assembled um, clinical researchers from around the globe to update the clinical care guidelines. There are currently over 70 um, 
physician researchers, um, nurses, physical therapists, um, all working to update the um, care guidelines. And those should be available early next year. We announced um, a little over a month ago um, the launch of the FA Accelerator at the Broad. This is similar to our Center of Excellence at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where we try and get, um, you know, a, a, we bring together researchers at one institution with different areas of expertise, different technologies, different approaches, and create a way for them to work together um, on FA from things like drug discovery, therapeutic discoveries, um, and you know, um, at the Broad, it's very much focused on drug discovery. So they're doing uh, molecule screening, uh, looking for those for toxin memetics that Liz talked about, as well as looking at gene editing approaches. We established a new grant award this year called the Award for Innovative Mindset. We asked researchers to submit, you know, really high risk, um, out of the box projects to us um, where they would be able to test these ideas within a one year time frame. And we received 17 applications and we were able to make four um, grant awards and all of those projects um, started earlier this month. We also hosted a biomarker and clinical outcome uh, conference this uh, September 24th and 25th. And so we had five sessions over two days. We had more than 300 people register and about 200 of them were from pharma and biotech. And, you know, again, um, sometimes doing things virtually we think isn't the most optimal way to do a meeting, but typically when we've had this meeting in the past, we've only had about 100 attendees. And so we were able to triple the attendance um, during the virtual meeting. And, you know, I think people um, appreciated the opportunity to participate and we received a lot of good um, feedback from the meeting as well. So quickly, just wanted to give you a sense of, you know, where are we with grant funding for this year? I showed you the graph where I said it was going up and up. Um, we're currently um, funding $7 million in research for 2020 in all different types of um, therapeutic areas. So drug discovery, uh, gene and stem cell therapy. We are still funding basic science, you know, to further our understanding of the underlying mechanisms of the disease, because by doing that, we can discover new targets for new therapies. Um, we fund a lot of clinical research. So our natural history study, cardiac research, um, discovery of new biomarkers, um, you know, so our, our research portfolio rem remains very broad and diverse um, so that you know, we can bring new things into the therapeutic pipeline and hopefully have the tools in place to test them and then to also have the you know, clinical research infrastructure, the outcome measures and the biomarkers that we need to test therapies in clinic. Um, and kind of streamline and de-risk this drug development process as much as possible. So Liz, um, as Liz said at the end of her talk, I'm gonna try and pick up where she left off um, with highlighting some of the therapeutic approaches. Um, I'm not going to spend much time today, I'm not gonna spend any time today on gene editing or gene therapy. Um, I really want to focus on some of the other programs because we'll have um, a whole nother two sessions on both gene and uh, gene editing therapies. So this is um, the treatment pipeline and I believe many of you are familiar with this. So the different treatment approaches that Liz talked to you about, targeting mitochondrial function, metabolic pathways, um, the frataxin protein, increasing gene expression, gene therapy are all listed down here on the left. And then across is sort of the, the drug development process from discovery all the way to, all the way to an approved therapy that is um, available, which is obviously um, our end goal. I'm also not gonna focus on 
uh, OMAP in my talk because Dr. Lynch is going to talk after me specifically giving you an update on where we are with the OMAP program. And I'm not going to spend much time talking about um, the NAD and exercise study because Dr. Kim Lynn and Shana McCormick talked about that at our opening session. And so if you didn't see their presentation, you can go back and look at it because um, they talk about the, this NAD and exercise study specifically. So I'm going to try and focus on um, the programs that are in clinical trials right now. And again, um, picking up where Liz left off, looking downstream of Fritaxin, there are different um, ways in which Fritaxin deficiency impacts the mitochondria. And there are several um, molecules in clinical trials trying to address these different mechanisms. The first one I'm going to give you an update on is RT001. Um, this is a polyunsaturated fatty acid that blocks lipid peroxidation. So when there's oxidative stress in the cell, um, the cell is more susceptible to lipid peroxidation, which breaks down the membrane of the mitochondria, um, which is not good, obviously. And so these molecules are trying to quench that reaction um, and preserve the mitochondria and help the mitochondria function better. There was an earlier clinical trial in FA that was completed, a phase one study, where they looked at safety and dose in a small number of FA patients. Um, and that study was completed and published back in 2018. And early this year, um, the very beginning of the year, uh, Retrotope started a phase two, three study of RT001 to specifically look at efficacy, um, so benefit over time. And the goal is, um, this is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. They are hoping to enroll 60 subjects, randomized one-to-one, one, one to drug, one to placebo. Um, they're looking for individuals ages 12 to 50. The um, participation in the study takes about 15 months from screening to the absolute end at the washout, uh, the final washout visit. That involves multiple uh, clinic visits during those 15 months. Uh, the efficacy assessments are things like cardiopulmonary exercise testing, walk tests, speech tests, um, the um, rating scales that you're all familiar with. In addition, there's on continued safety evaluations that are also done um, because now we get to look at the drug over a longer period of time. That initial study was um, for 30 days, I believe, and so this will give us a better, better sense of longer term safety, close to a year. Um, and so this study, like I said, opened um, at the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, and started uh, hitting its stride right when we had to halt enrollment for several months. But um, since we've been able to open back up, um, our clinical research sites and um, our patient community has been um, really um, motivated to make up for lost time. And we're hoping that we'll have all 60 subjects enrolled by the end of October, which would be fabulous. And again, the, the primary read or the primary outcome of this study is to look at um, change from baseline on the peak workload as measured by the cardiopulmonary exercise test. But there are also other endpoints like the uh, Friedrich's taxia rating scale, timed walk, speech, fatigue, um, that are also being measured and assessed. The next study I wanna to talk to you about is one that um, hasn't opened yet, but will open later in the year. And um, it just um, went up on clinicaltrials.gov just recently. And back in September, um, Susan facilitated a, a webinar with PTC Therapeutics to talk a little bit more about it. So if you're, um, you know, I'm gonna, just gonna give you a really quick overview. If you wanna learn more about the drug and the study, um, please visit Susan's webinar. So this is a um, randomized, double-blind placebo-controlled trial as well um, with an open-label extension. And it's testing both the efficacy and safety of vetaquinone 
or PTC 743 um, as a treatment for FA. And they're calling the study MOVE FA, which is much easier than that very long title. Um, so PTC 743 or vatiquinone targets an enzyme called 15 lipoxygenase. And over the last few years, um, as more research was done on the compound and on how the compound works in FA, it turns out that um, this enzyme has a role in regulating oxidative stress and inflammation um, in situations where there's mitochondrial dysfunctions, specifically in neurons or in the central nervous system. Um, and they've also been able to um, test you know, Liz talked about one of those um, downstream consequences of frataxin loss leading to excess iron in the cell and a process called ferroptosis. And what they can, um, what they've recently shown is that this drug can block that ferroptosis process. So the study um, has been designed um, to be double blind, like I said. Um, they're going to stratify participants, you know, based on different markers of disease severity. So your 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 neurologic exam score, your age of onset, um, your age at the time of entering the study, uh, as a way to try and make sure that we have um, homogeneous cohort. The drug will be tested for seventy two weeks. And then at the end of the 72 weeks, participants will be invited to enroll into an open label extension. The primary outcome measure is the modified Friedrichs Taxia rating scale. And again, comparing the change from baseline to 72 weeks. Um, there are also secondary outcome measures, the activities of daily living scale, uh, one minute walk test, and they'll also be monitoring the number of falls that people have during the study. Um, you do have to be ambulatory to be able to participate in the study. So the other inclusion criteria, um, they're inviting individuals who are age seven and older with a confirmed diagnosis of FA. Um, you have to be within a certain range on the FARS. You have to be able to ambulate at least, at least 10 feet in one minute, and that can be with, assist, with an assistive device. Um, there are some medications you have to abstain from using um, when you're in the study, and you have to be able to swallow pills. Um, the goal is to enroll um, over 100 individuals into the study, and so this is going to be an international trial with sites in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia. The next study I want to give you an update on is um, with a compound called MIN-102. So MIN-102 is um, called a PPAR gamma agonist. So what is that? Um, one of the pathways in the diagram that Liz showed you that is down-regulated in FA is called PGC1-alpha. And PGC1-alpha is important for making new mitochondria. And so um, one way to make new mitochondria is to activate this PGC1-alpha pathway. And there are drugs that can do that. Um, one drug um, that's currently on the market to treat other conditions is called pioglitazone. Um, but pioglitazone doesn't get into the central nervous system very well, and it also has some um, toxic side effects, especially um, for individuals with, with specific types of heart disease. And so this um, is not pioglitazone, but it's a metabolite of pioglitazone that has a better safety profile and has um, better access to the brain. And this drug has been tried in another um, disease called adrenomyeloneuropathy, and, um, which is also a disease that affects the central nervous system. They started this trial back in 2019. Um, it's a phase two study. Um, the study has been done at four sites across Europe. And they finished enrollment um, at the beginning of the year. And they were actually able to keep um, 
all, all patients were enrolled prior, prior to COVID starting. And so they were able to keep the study visits going. Um, they were able to successfully finish enrollment, finish all the study visits, um, which again is just a huge accomplishment to all of the people who participated in the study, as well as those clinical trial sites. Um, the last patient visit for the study was held last month in September. And so we're expecting um, results from Minarex um, before the end of the year. So at this point, they are um, you know, continuing to put all the data into the database, do all the queries, you know, get, make sure everything in the database is clear and set up their analysis plan, and then they'll do their analysis and share the results with the community. Um, this was an interesting study too, because it looked at a lot of novel biomarkers. Um, the primary outcome measure was actually an MRI measure. So they were looking at um, the area of the, the spinal cord uh, using MRI, specifically at, at uh, cervical vertebrae two and three, um, and looking to see if it changed over 48 weeks. So I'm going back to um, Liz's slide now to switch gears. I'm not talking about um, you know, downstream consequences of frataxin loss, but frataxin loss itself and frataxin replacement. And so Laramar Therapeutics is advancing CTI 1601, which is frataxin replacement. And as Liz told you, this is basically you know, using um, viral chaperones to get for toxin protein into the cell. And I went back to um, look at the talk that I gave at the symposium last year. And last year we were talking about um, getting ready to test 1601 in clinical trials. And so at that time they were just finishing up um, the animal studies that looked at safety um, they were still working on the full toxicology studies and the manufacturing um, and preparing their application to the Food and Drug Administration um, for their IND. An IND is an investigational new drug application and this has to be submitted um, to the FDA prior to starting any human clinical trials. And so um, that IND was submitted late in 2019 and it was approved. And so the company was able to start this phase one trial um, in early 2020. Phase one primarily looks at safety and dose. This is the first time this frataxin replacement is given to people. And so it's very important that um, we start with this um, early phase study, again, to establish safety and dose so that we understand how the drug behaves when we give it to people. Um, Again, huge effort um, by everyone, the, the company, the um, clinical site, and the patient community to um, manage to finish four single ascending dose cohorts and one multiple ascending dose cohort this year with still another multiple ascending dose cohort um, to be completed later this month. And then hopefully the final one in early 2021. Um, so it's exactly how it sounds. In those single ascending dose cohorts, people were given the drug one time, and there were lots of assessments for safety, um, lots of blood samples drawn, monitoring constantly. Um, this study required people to go to a clinical research unit and stay there for multiple days at a time um, so that they could be closely monitored for safety. And then when we had COVID on top of it, it added extra days to people's stay so that they could first be monitored to make sure um, that they were free of COVID and then start the study. Um, so people are, ha are having to stay in the clinical research unit um, for anywhere from about 10 days now to about 21, 22 days. Um, so a huge commitment on behalf of the study volunteers um, for being willing to um, you know, put their life on hold for that period of time and make this kind of commitment to advancing our research. So 
So just to um, quickly wrap up, I couldn't cover everything, um, but we've got four trials that are currently enrolling. Um, the two that I just talked about, as well as the NAD and exercise study that opened in September. Um, and then there's also a study in Australia ongoing of resveratrol. I believe there might be one or two sites in Australia that are open, but there's also several sites that are still on hold due to COVID. Um, there is also um, active um, studies that are not enrolling. The Minarex study I told you just finished its last patient visit. They're analyzing the data. And um, Dr. Lynch will give you an update on where we are with the RIATA study, but everybody's in what's called the open label extension right now. And then upcoming trials, we have PTC 743. Um, in Italy, there are two clinical trials that have been planned and hopefully we'll be able to start later this year. One looking at dimethylfumarate NFA and the other looking at a travarine. And there's also um, a clinical trial that's been planned to look at um, a drug called nicotinamide, but it um, has been delayed uh, for multiple reasons and it's, it's not clear to me um, if it will get its start this year or not. And so I just want to end by, again, thanking um, our community, you know, our clinical research centers, the, the clinicians, the researchers, the coordinators, the hospital staff, um, for getting up and running um, as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. Also for, you know, being really quick to adapt new approaches, um, such as virtual visits for our natural history study, um, for safety evaluations, for some of the clinical trials. Um, you know, really earlier this year, everyone was um, doing their best to figure out how to do things differently as quickly as possible so that we didn't have a big delay to our research. And again, our industry partners who have been hugely supportive of making sure that research goes forward and to all of you um, for volunteering and supporting each other um, in this community. And so with that, I think I can take a few questions. Um, and if I don't have time for all the questions, we should have time at the end as well. So, Pam um, asked the first question, which is, what actions are being taken to assure affordability and coverage for any new drugs for FA? Um, great question, Pam, thank you very much. Um, you know, um, it's, um, I think, a, an issue that's in the um, media a lot now um, with many new drugs um, having, you know, a high cost associated with them. Um, I think one of the important things to consider is not only the, um, the cost of the medication, but the programs that can be available, right, to make sure that people have access. Um, so cost is one thing, but access is even more important, I think. And many of our um, industry partners have been talking to talking with FARA specifically about programs that can be put in place to make sure that patients have access, um, no matter what type of insurance they may have, and so that the, the companies will be able to work with insurance providers and develop programs that can bridge some of the gaps um, in coverage and affordabil affordability, and, and that's something that we'll continue to talk to them about. Um, the next question, Pam, you have a lot of good questions for me. Um, why don't clinical trials seem to be recruiting through the patient registry anymore? Um, so we are still using the patient registry. Um, we migrated to a new patient registry platform in November of 2019. And that platform does not allow us to directly email you through the registry itself, but we can access people's email addresses and information from the new registry, pull out a list of people to email, and Susan emails them through 
her email account. So we are still using the registry to recruit um, for clinical trials. And that's a great way for me to also encourage folks, if you're not in the new registry, to please go on and please register. Um, the registry is similar to the old one, but a little bit different and asks a whole lot more questions. And there are some important surveys in the new registry that we really need um, as many people as possible to continue to um, fill out and, and share their information so that we can design and recruit for clinical trials in the future effectively. And I know I'm a little bit over, so maybe what I'll do is I'll leave these questions here in the queue um, so that Dr. Lynch can go and give his update, and then we'll come back to these questions as we have time at the end. Mm -hmm. Sound good? All right. So Sounds with that. just fine. I'll have a little <laughs> extra coffee so I go quickly so that we can get back. Nobody wants you to go quickly, Dave. <laughs> so um, I just would like to introduce our next speaker, although I'm not sure um, he needs an introduction. I think he's well known to everyone in the community. Dr. David Lynch is a neurologist and neuroscientist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, he is the principal investigator of the Collaborative Clinical Research Network in FA the Natural History Study, multiple clinical trials. He's co-director of the Center of Excellence in Friedrich's Ataxia at CHOP. And um, I don't know if everyone's aware of this, but the reason I work in FA is because of Dr. Lynch. Um, Dr. Lynch introduced me to Friedrich's Ataxia in this community uh, when I was at my first job at the University of Pennsylvania. So thanks, Dave. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you for staying with it all these years. So uh, uh, thanks. I'm going to be talking about the omaviloxalone trial, also called RT408, also called OMAV for short and for obvious reasons, which concluded its double blind phase about a year ago. Uh, today, I'm going to concentrate on clinical trial findings. Some of my slides are relatively technical. I'm going to try and simply emphasize uh, less of the technical component, but those people who want to look at all the technical components can go back and look at them when the slides are posted. I want to thank Jamie for running my slides today, as well as my friends at Riata for helping supply me with some of these slides, which have shown, been shown publicly at the American Academy of Neurology meeting, as well as on the FARA biomarkers program about two weeks ago. Can I have the next slide, Jamie? which is simply to say that we get grants to run the study. Uh, this is not an approved medication at this time and is not available anywhere in the world at this point. Next slide. As you heard from Liz's talk earlier today, the downstream component of Friedreich ataxia, after you talk about the loss of her taxa and the mitochondrial dysfunction, involves a variety of pathophysiologic pathways, two of which we talked about are ferroptosis, which is the pathway which is targeted by PTC743, as well as potential reactive oxygen species production, also called free radicals, which are thought to play a role in uh, cell death in FA and cellular dysfunction. Now, free radicals are produced all the time, and in fact, are in normal messengers in our body at some point. But it's when they get to be too much that they can cause problems. Fortunately, we have all evolved a system for handling this. Next slide. And that's system is through the transcription factor called NRF2 or NRF2. It's an endogenous molecule, protein and transcription factor, that turns on the genes in your body, which help you respond to oxidative stress or reactive oxygen species. Normally, your NRF2, the protein, is destined for degradation because it binds to a protein called KEEP1. In its most simplistic way to look at this, omaviloxalone, OMAV, displaces the keep one from NRF2 so that NRF2 can enter the nucleus and turn on the genes of the so-called ARE or antioxidant response element, which are responsible for protecting you against uh, reactive oxygen species. Next slide, Jamie. This is a slide of some of the various research done largely by Paoli Gionti's lab in uh, London on, uh, react on NRF2 as, and OMAB in particular. What you see is that given, these are all cells, uh, experiments in cells, and what you can see is that by giving OMAP to the cells, sometimes derived from patients, sometimes uh, from other models, 
it improves, it improves the amount of glutathione, which is your endogenous antioxidant. It decreases cell death. It decreases the amount of mitochondrial reaction, oxygen species production and de uh, decreases the amount of lipid peroxidation, which is the long-term outcome of reactive oxygen species. So it makes sense based on this that OMAV should go to a clinical trial in FA. Next slide, please. I'll remind you all, if I remember correctly what's on my next slide, that the way we tend to measure things in clinical trial, and my memory is intact, is through the quantified neurologic exam called the MFARS, or Modified Free Taxi Rating Scale. Most of you have done it in our offices. It's a quantified way to look at disease, heavily weighted toward how people can stand and walk. It's been validated through all that natural history data that you contribute to over the course of the past 17 years that allows us to show that really this does change in time and mark the disease progression. Next slide, Jamie. So MOXIE, which is the name of the study for omovaloxalone, is a three-part study. In part one, we were attempting to find the correct dose. I think that goes largely to one of the questions that's being asked. You have an early study which determines the correct dose and whether you have to normalize by weight and things like that. Then part two is the main thing I'll talk about today, which is the double blind portion, randomized, placebo controlled, all over the world, designed to show if the drug does work and if it is safe in a large population. The primary endpoint for that study was the MFARS exam 40 weeks after starting. And then there's an ongoing part three where people who were in part two are staying on drug to help get, uh, gather more long-term safety data. Could I have the next slide, Jamie? This is part one, and what we look at here is uh, in the part one, we looked at the ability of different doses given along the x-axis here to raise ferritin levels, and ferritin levels, which are a marker of iron, are abnormally low in people with FA, and GGT, which is also somewhat low in people with FA. You can see that the optimum dose was around 160 milligrams a day, and if you look at the improvement in MFARS in those same patients, you can see that the dosing and the statistically significant improvement was optimal at the same dose. So we know the ideal dose is around 150 to 160 milligrams a day. It was also safe within this group without any serious adverse events related to drug, which justified us moving on to a part two, a more pivotal trial. Next slide. In this part, there were a total of 100 people enrolled. They had to have baseline scores of MFARs between 20 and 80. They had to be between 16 and 40 years of age. Half of the people got 150 milligrams a day of OMAP. Half the people got, 100, uh, got a placebo. The primary endpoint, as I mentioned, was the MFARs. And then a variety of secondary endpoints, which are there to help confirm that your primary endpoint isn't doing something just funny, as well as show direct relevance to patient abilities. The bottom is a diagram of the study. Next slide. Everything is randomized. That is, that's how we account for the variability in people in their routine. We try to match in some ways, but usually the way we get around that is we randomize. Randomization will match your groups, ideally. And what you see when we did this, looking at the people on OMAV, which is 40, and the people on placebo 42, and you look at their basic characteristics, they're all the same. The randomization works. So this is a fair study. There's a very small difference in GA repeat link, less than 40 GAAs, which is really not much. And the very small difference in the number of people who reported cardiomyopathy. Uh, we actually balanced those out in the end uh, statistically. So the randomization worked. This is a fair study. Next slide. And this is the key slide. On the left, we look at how people's MFARS exam changed from their baseline. And the right, you compare the placebo change to the change in the people on drug. Going up on the scale is bad. Going down toward the bottom of the scale is good. Active drug is in green. Uh, placebo is in red. And what you see is a couple things. Mo the most important thing is that 48 weeks, there's about two point, uh, almost 2.5 MFARS points difference between the two groups. Uh, that's about two years of FA progression in this group. You can look on the right and see that the placebo corrected change is linearly increases over the course of the year. That is, over the course of a year, the improvement builds, not decays. There is no immediate adaptation to the drug. The other thing I want people to know as they grew th go through their life and think about things, I want you to look at the 12-week point on the left-hand graph. 
you see that the placebo group and the active drug don't diverge for the first three months of the study. This is seen in just about every study in FA and almost every neurologic disease study period. In the first three months, you have no, you can say nothing about benefit for any drug because of the size of the placebo, placebo response. So it, what really is different in this study and others is the maintenance of that response and increasing of it relative to placebo over the course of 48 weeks. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can also do something else. You've all participated in the natural history data, uh, study, or many of you have. This basically shows that the placebo group, and I'm not gonna go through the detailed numbers, change the same way that people in the natural history study change with a very slight difference. In other words, this wasn't, the placebo group was not a group of atypical FA individuals. You can thus trust this result is probably real. Next slide, please. You can look at different parts of the MFARS exam. We separate them into, into bulbar, that's facial stuff, upper limbs, lower limbs, and then upright stability, which is standing. While the error bars, and that's the parallel, the lines that go around the original point differ on each of these due to variability. Each one of these scores got better in the aggregate group. So it's not acting on a single part. It's not that makes it less likely to be simply a symptomatic therapy, but working on the disease mechanism. Next slide for me. We can also separate out the different groups. The original outcome is here at the top, and then you can look at people who are under 18, who improved a little more than people over 18. Men and women approved about the same. People with longer repeat lengths uh, improved a little more than shorter repeat lengths. People who uh, were non-ambulatory improved a little bit more mean, but had greater variability than the ambulatory. You can see there's a little difference in each of them, but in each one, every group and every strata improved. There wasn't a group of people who did not improve. The primary outcome measure at statistical analysis did not include the people with higher feet, pest cabus. That's uh, because the variability uh, uh, and the magnitude of effect is smaller in pest cabus individuals, but people with pest cabus did in fact improve. So in fact, every group improved on the drug. You see none of them toward the red side and the worsening. Next slide for me. We can also look at a very particular measure called the patient and clinician global impression of change. This is very simple. It's simply a question. Do you feel better? Do you feel a little better, a lot better, a huge amount better? Do you feel worse, a little worse, a lot worse? It did not statistically significantly improve, but it correlated very well with the MFAR score. Thus, you can see that patients were also reporting improvement in parallel with their MFAR score. Those numbers were quite significant. Next slide, please. You could also look at those activities of daily living which people fill out. Uh, if you look at the whole group across all the patients, it is nominally statistically significant, but within the primary analysis group, it was not. It just missed the statistical significance. But if you look at each one of the questions, people always, their numbers you see go down here. They always got better. None of those questions got worse. This is clearly a non-random event. So I think it is likely that people's activities of daily living were also improving. Next slide, please. You could also look at some blood tests, uh, look at what happens to ferritin levels, look what happens to uh, total bilirubin, which would look in the kidney function, and basically OMAV improves those. Those numbers are not particularly abnormal in FA, but they're slightly abnormal, and the drug improves them. So you know it's hitting its pharmacological target, and you know it's having an activity, uh, not just simply on patient measures, but on biochemical measures as well. Next slide, please. This is a summary chart, again, prepared by my friends at Riata. Uh, remember, green is, blue-green is still improved. Red is still got worse. You don't see any red on this slide. So in everything we measure, things either got better or in a couple stayed the same. This is, well, we talk about 100 patients as a large study. This study did not have the statistical power to predict an improvement in the nine-hole peg test in time 25-foot walk, thus it's no shock that it, uh, didn't get better, simply not enough people to prove that. But overall, things did get better across these different measures. Last slide, please. 
No, it's not the last slide. The other important thing out there is, of course, safety. Short story, with the exception of liver function enzymes, there are no differences in any adverse event between the placebo and the active uh, drug arms. This differs a little bit from the part one in which people did see a higher incidence of infections if they were on active drug. That didn't replicate, so that was just something which happened in part one, which probably is not meaningful. Liver enzymes do go up in this. They go up beginning a few weeks after starting, but then they fall after reaching a peak. This is not thought to be a toxic event. It is thought to be a reactivation of the liver because remember the liver is subclinically affected in FA. For taxin levels uh, in the body are very high in liver. It's just that your liver does, is not clinically affected because it turns over most likely. So when you turn it back on, you see the liver rev itself up in a physiologic normal manner and the enzymes go up transiently. That's the most reasonable interpretation because no other liver function test of synthesis uh, changed and in fact, bilirubin improved. Next slide, please. So overall, what does this mean? The part two data shows that OMAB does improve neurologic function assessed by the MFARs. They were in all pre-specified groups and across all subpopulations. Uh, it improves some activities of daily living and other efficacy measures. It was also very well tolerated, which makes it a possible therapeutic agent uh, for FA. I'll thank all my collaborators, which are around the world, and I am not listed here today. And I guess I'll take some questions, if, if there are any. And if they're not, we'll just move on to something else. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Dave, for going through um, more detailed you know, um, review of all the study results. There, um, there are a few questions that are coming in. Um, the first question from Chandra is, why is OMAD taken on an empty stomach? Has to do with its, uh, so it has to do with its absorption. It's absorbed better on an empty stomach. I'll give you a contrast. This is in contrast to either PTC743 or adebanone, which you realize are uh, absorbed better when you take it with fat. OMAB is the opposite. Let's see. All right. Here's another um, question from Chris. Are there any opportunities where a patient could begin taking OMAV um, if they were not in a previous study? So at this point, there are no opening studies of OMAV. It's not approved, so it's not available anywhere in the world at this point. Uh, there are no studies open at this point to recruit for OMAV, so that's not an option at this point. Uh, I would defer to my Rayada colleagues on what their path forward is at this point and whether they'll be opening other studies and where. So Fabrice has um, a question on some of the data that you presented. Um, for Moxie Part 2, uh, it looks good up to week 36, then got worse again at week 48. I think he's talking about it looked like it kind of plateaued maybe. Yes, I, um, I think that's, so what is the evolution during that four week interval? And do you know, um, do you have longer, uh, longer data now? So the answer to the question, so the week 48 is not statistically different than 36. Whether that's a minimal fall off or a plateau or a fluctuation, we don't know. At this point, we are still evaluating the data for the time immediately following discontinuation, as well as in the extension study. I hope to have more uh, available the next time I speak to this group, not the next time I speak, which will probably be quite soon. So um, we have two, two questions that are kind of related from uh, Paul and Heather. Um, you know, Paul's asking, uh, why did FDA hedge if all the results are positive? Um, and Heather's asking, when will we hear from the FDA? <laughs> so the answer to those questions, Heather's question is easy. No. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, I don't know, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe other people know, but I am not one of them. Uh, and I'm going to try not to talk about the regulatory process other than to say that every time I've met with the FDA, I've been impressed at how complicated the process is and all the things that you need to think about that you may not have thought about before. 
Uh, so I'm not going to get inside their minds, and I don't kn know their exact details. I will let uh, Riata has a press release on it that says I think most of the details. I will note in passing that my president only interacts with the FDA. Is of course I think people have heard this that Steve Hahn, the chair, the head of the FDA. Actually, I worked in the same lab as him 40 years ago. I wrote him an email about a year ago to congratulate him on his appointment and he didn't seem to know who I was. So I don't think we can count on anything, <laughs> any special favors. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't very memorable at that point in my life. Dave, maybe I, I'll, I'll take a, a crack at just trying to help people understand at least some of the framework that the FDA works within and the framework that, that works and, and our sponsors have to work within. Um, so that the law is technically that you need at least two um, well-controlled, placebo-controlled trials that are both positive for a drug to be considered for approval. Um, recently, there were updates to that law that allow for some special exceptions in the cases of rare diseases. Um, but the, the interpretation of that is not very clear. So you, if you are rare disease, and if a study is adequate and well controlled, um, you can have one trial um, be sufficient along with confirmatory evidence. And what's, what's considered adequate and well controlled is somewhat up for interpretation in the experience I think we've had. And what can suffice for confirmatory evidence is also something that gets negotiated and discussed with FDA. Um, and so it's not, um, it, it's not always crystal clear what the exact path will be through the FDA review process and getting to the place where, you know, we get a green light from them to submit a new drug application. Um, and so I think part of what's happening now is we're going through some of that learning process. Uh, so we have a few other questions that I will try and get to. Um, Dr. Lynch, if you have a few more minutes, can you, can you stay I on can for hang a few on. more My questions? My dog is no longer barking, so I think we're okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to go back to a few of the other questions that I didn't get to earlier. Um, Nick asks, what's happening with the Traverine research, both globally and in the U.S.? So I know that um, there was a clinical trial that was planned um, for uh, to happen in Italy. And my understanding is it's currently been on hold due to some of the COVID restrictions that they've had over the past seven months. So they, I don't believe they've started it yet, but it's my understanding that they do plan to um, do the study once it's safe for them to do so. Um, I'm not aware of anything going on in the U.S. right now for a traveling Dr. Lynch, do you? I'm not aware of anything. I know of a couple of basic science investigations, but nothing else. Um, can someone enroll in a trial if they are not based in the country where the trial is taking place? Great question. It depends. <laughs> uh, it depends on several things. Um, sometimes the sponsor of the study will have um, rules in place about whether or not people can travel from other countries to participate. Um, and sometimes there are restrictions with the clinic site into whether or not they can adequately accommodate people from out of country. Um, and sometimes it depends on the research participants ability to, um, you know, participate fully in the trial, be able to get to all the study visits, especially if they're from out of country. Um, so I know from some examples, like we've been able to have people from Canada come to the US for some clinical trials. We've even had some people from Europe come to the US for some clinical trials. Um, people in the European Union have been able to travel um, to other countries in the EU for participation in clinical trials. Would you, Add anything else to that, Dave? No, I think that's most of it. The only thing I would add is, yeah, usually it's not the 
written rules is the pragmatic aspects of participating, be it cost, being it time away from home. The one thing I would add is if there is a person uh, who does intend to travel to the United States to participate in a clinical trial, during the time they're in the United States, they should pay for personal medical insurance. Because remember that the studies provide medical care for the study, but other things may occur. And that really handicaps you. It runs into a lot of troubles if those things do randomly occur while you're in the United States and don't have medical insurance. Let's see. Not a requirement, it's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. A few other questions I think we, we have, um, we'll be able to take. Um, this question's from Pam. When drugs are tested in clinical trials, how do you decide whether to give them give everyone the same dose or whether to vary the dose based on the person's weight? So that, I take it that one's for me. Yes. So you, that's, <laughs> or maybe we'll ask Barbara. <laughs> we'll do that. That's one of the reasons we do all those phase one and phase two studies as well as the dosing in animals. You need to know whether blood levels or target organ levels are related to our uh, dose on weight. That is, uh, to get the same blood level in everyone, you regulate the amount you take based on weight, or you don't. Or sometimes in adults, you will go up by weight until you reach the prototypic 70 kilograms, and then everything plateaus out. It gets very complicated in some cases because you also have, you can't, if it's, unless it's a liquid, uh, you're limited in the size of the pills you can make. You can't make uh, uh, pills that are one milligram if you're looking for someone to take 100 milligrams a day on a weight basis. So sometimes we group. It's also dependent as again on uh, absorption and a variety of things. So that's actually, when you participate in a phase one, phase two trial, that's a big amount of the information that's coming out is how it needs to be dosed. And so, so basically, just to summarize, it's multiple factors, the drug and, itself, yeah, what it, kind of drug, drug it is. More than anything. Yeah, and then figuring out how it actually gets absorbed, what that efficiency looks like, and then you can decide, you know, will weight be a factor in that, and will you have to adjust for it? Yeah. Uh, let's see, all right, this one is for me. Um, Paul came back to the registry question asking if we're using the old database at all. Uh, and we are still currently using the old patient registry because we have more patient data in the old registry still than in the new registry. Um, so we are currently using both to help recruit for clinical trials. But like I said, we really would like everyone to migrate to the new platform, the new system, because it has more uh, research capacity for the future. And um, we um, eventually won't be able to use the old one. Um, it is built on very old technology. <laughs> um, and it we're on borrowed time. Um, so it really is important for people to get all of their information into the new registry. Thanks for asking that question. Um, let's see, maybe we'll do one or two more here. Um, oh, quick question. Sue Kittle's asking um, where you can view the presentation. So if you go to the, um, the app for the conference, um, either on your website, or through the website, or through your phone app, um, under agenda, you will see the recorded version of this webinar and the other ones that have been done previously um, by clicking on the, the agenda and going to the specific session. And it usually takes us a few hours to get the webinar um, uploaded to the site. So later this evening, um, the webinar should be available there. And if you have trouble finding it, just email us at Farah, and we'll help you find it. And let's see. Um, Jason's asking, um, how will we know when the PTC 743 study starts recruiting? Ah, good. Good follow-up to the patient registry question. Um, so FARA will put out multiple notices. We'll send out uh, emails to people in the registry. We will uh, put a notice up on our website. 
I know clinical sites like Dr. Lynch's will email all of the people who they see at their clinic site to let them know that the study is open and that they're enrolling. Um, I would expect, like other trials in the past, it's possible that not all the sites will open at the same time. So it might have a staggered start, especially given the fact that it's an international study. I'll insert one thing. As you, Jen reviewed the inclusion criteria, I remind everyone for one particular. If you or your child carry a point mutation, you are not eligible for that study. So that's one thing uh, that is in the final inclusion criteria. I'm officially not allowed to acknowledge that, but Jen showed it. So if you carry a point mutation, you should not be looking at that study. You should be either looking at one of Dr. McCormick's studies or getting into the final days of Retrotope or something like that. Yeah, like I said, there is a clinicaltrials.gov post for the 743 study now, and it gives a lot more detail even than what I went into, but covers what Dr. Lynch just mentioned as well about point mutation individuals. Um, Gretchen has a question. Um, so with COVID-19 being a primary focus of the FDA these days, have lead times changed for their responses back to investigators um, about submissions for clinical trials and approvals? Um, I'll try and take, take that one. Um, you know, they are mandated with certain submissions that they have to respond in a certain period of time. So um, that's still, they, they are still mandated to um, those turnaround times, but um, it is very clear that they are stretched pretty thin and don't have a lot of time to review and prepare things in general. Um, and on the gene therapy side, especially, um, you know, I think, I think there's concern because um, a lot of the COVID vaccine um, studies would be going through that biologics division. And already, you know, the biologics division saw a huge increase in gene therapy submissions for all kinds of diseases. Um, and now they've got the COVID workload on top of that. Um, so it, they are stretched really, really thin. Um, and I, I think it is a, a valid concern, Gretchen, that, you know, until the COVID-19 situation is um, further down the road, we may likely um, see some delays or, um, you know, the FDA needing to adjust and, and hopefully they'll be able to um, expand their, um, their bandwidth. But right now they, they are stretched incredibly thin. Uh, let's see, maybe we'll do one more question. Does that sound good, Dr. Lynch? Sure, why not? One more. Let's see. Um, some of these are the same question. Um, here's one um, from Fabrice. For our, all the clinical trials, do you first balance the inputs in vitamins and minerals in the cells and the mitochondria um, to be the, the best condition to evaluate the effects of the treatment? Trying yeah. to see, did you get that? Yeah, I get it. So the question is really, how do we balance the populations given that people take different things? There are various approaches. For example, PTC will have you go off of every antioxidant that might alter the response to PTC so that you have to stop taking them and thus everyone's balanced by being off of them. In some cases, for example, if you use a drug that's not interact, that's not an antioxidant, that's unnecessary. And the way you balance it is by randomization. That is to say, uh, you take 100 people and you randomly assign them, you will end up with groups which are ideally balanced, the way it worked out in Mox MOXIE, the randomization worked. I will note if you go back to the EPI 743 trial about six years ago, the randomization didn't work. And what wasn't, it wasn't the drugs they take, is that the people who are on active drug ended up being more affected and thus aren't a perfect control for the people who are in the placebo group. And that always handicaps you. That's why in this one, I, PTC is stratifying. They're being sure that in each group, placebo versus drug, they have the same amount. But when you stratify, you always worry that you select for something else. So you can't match everything. 
This is why we need a reasonably large number of people. I'll mention that one of the reasons the MOXIE study worked so well is the data was very tight. The standard deviations were low because in this question they mentioned, do you want everyone at their optimum? In fact, the data were very tight. We believe, based on a few different reasons, that the data were tight because we examined everyone after their exercise testing. We didn't examine them at the best they were, we examined them at the worst they would be. And that's a much leveler, if that's a word, playing field than trying to match everyone to their optimum and trying to tune everyone up. And to, you might say, get them the same amount of sleep the night before. You take everyone at their minimum. I think that's actually worked in that study and it's one of the reasons it reaches its end point. So um, just to wrap up, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions um, this afternoon. We will, I've got them all here, so I will try and follow up as well um, individually with folks. I'm happy to do that. But there are a series of, of similar questions, again, just related to timeline for um, FDA feedback, decision, approval related to OMAV. And as Dr. Lynch said, um, we just don't, we, we can't predict right now. Um, what that timeline is exactly going to look like. Uh, Riata is in communication with the FDA. And so our recommendation for you is to really um, stay alert. Riata has been committed to communicating with our community um, as soon as they have information and in real time. And so once they have information, I, I'm confident they're going to share it with us. And you know, we'll be able to have follow-up um, information sessions as more information becomes available, as next steps become uh, clearer for all of us. But we we hear you all. We 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 know you're anxious um, for for information and a timeline. And you know, as soon as that's that's available, that's something that we'll be happy to make sure we we share with you. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for attending this evening and thank all of our speakers for participating in this um, seminar in the virtual symposium and hope that you'll stay with us and join us um, next week. We have um, talks, I believe Dr. Lynch, you're up next to talk about and COVID. And about COVID and Friedrich Ataxia. Yes. So join us later uh, this coming week for, for the next installment of the symposium series and have a good night, everyone. Take care. Bye.